Go ahead. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
working as a uh, so clinical assistant professor at the University of Houston Law School, teaching lawyering skills and strategies. So, whatever I forgot, Lauren, you can remind them of. <laughs> that's, that's Welcome and come on up. Thank you so much. Out my nerdy love of bees. So I'm going to try and see if this will advance. Kyle, I'm not seeing that it's advancing. All right, let's see. I'm going to try it now. Oh, there we go. Yay. Okay, so I'm pretty informal. This lecture will be like the, the chats I have with my students at Go Coons University of Houston Law Center, where I teach lawyer and skills and strategies, which is basically legal research and writing. That's my one passion, but my other passion is I'm a pollinator nerd, and especially I love bees. Um, and I like to teach people about how to create gardens at their home that the critters will love, in particular the bees, but also your neighbors. Because if it doesn't look like a garden, then your neighbors are not going to embrace it. And, and so I like to say it's about critters and community. It's both of the seeds, right? Okay. So uh, the one thing I want to tell you is a couple of things about this photo. So this is probably from last year, I think, in my front garden. So I live in the Oak Forest neighborhood, north and west of the Heights in Houston. My house is under 1,600 square feet, but a long time ago. And the front and backyards are comparable in size. They're proportional. The front yard is now about, I'd say, about 60% gardens. The backyard is a wasteland because that's where our dogs roam. So everything's up in the front. And we're now about 90 to 95% species that are native to this part of Texas, as far as our plants. And as over the years, I've increased those numbers of native plants, it has caused an explosion in biodiversity. Not just bees, but butterflies, wasps, moths, you name it. And so when I changed to that, it made all the difference in the world. The bees are particularly happy. The photos that you're going to see in here, unless they're labeled otherwise, those all come from my front gardens. And one of the raffle items tonight, I, um, I photograph the critters in our gardens and the plants. I use my cell phone, but they come out pretty nice. And I make these books, and that's one of the things that's going to be raffled up. And on the table, you'll see some other examples. So every photo you see comes from my garden. And here's the bottom line. You ready? If you build it, they will come. Right? This is smack dab in the middle of Houston in an urban neighborhood. So if you build it, they will come. Let me tell you about some of the things over on the table that you can play with afterwards. So one of the uh, public service things that I do is I harvest the seeds from those plants that are native to our region of Texas. I clean them-ish, I package them, and I have instruction sheets for most, and I give them away for free. So Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, all of the holidays, they're all over there on the table. For many of them, the instruction sheet tells you how to sow, when to sow, light, water, and soil requirements. For others, I didn't have time to create those sheets because I do like to sleep occasionally. So I have a little instruction sheet that you can photograph and take back with you. Um, the plants I'm going to show you at the end, I will point out if I have seeds for them. Okay? All right, so let's begin the beginning, as they say. Oh. Sorry. I think it keeps freezing up. Right? Yeah, here we go. Okay, so I thought we'd spend a little time talking about how honeybees differ from our native bees. So their presence here in North America and in particular in Texas. So first off, there's a lot of physical diversity with our native bees, right? And, and of course, we all know that honeybees are not native to here. Primarily European, um, they're domesticated and brought here, but they have become feral. The native bees look very, very different from honeybees in large part. So they range in color. So you can see that some of them, let's see if my pointer works, are green, right? Others are blue. Others have red, black, yellow, brown, and white. So they're very diverse in color. And they're also very diverse in size. So this is a participatory class. And those who don't participate have to stay after class to clean the erasers. Thank you, Tom Blair. And if you're old enough to get to that joke, welcome to my world, right? Okay, so everyone hold up your pinky finger. I want you to hold up your pinky finger. So look at the flesh part of your pinky finger. So that flesh part is the size of this flower head. Who knows what that flower head is? That's one of my favorite ground covers. That's called Texas frog fruit, Phyllanota flora. I don't have seeds for it, but it grows super well from cuttings. And I have cards over there, and anyone who wants cuttings from my garden to grow them, 100% email me. I'm happy to share it. 
So that whole flower head with those teeny flowers is no bigger than the flesh tone of your finger. And that bee is smaller than that flower head. And that, my friends, is not the smallest bee in North America. The smallest bee in North America is, are some of the fairy bees, which is the cutest name ever. And those can be maybe a couple of millimeters long. So to the eye, they look like a gnat. When I first saw this species, which is a metallic sweat bee, which is a cool name, I thought she was a gnat. So they can be very small. Now, hold up your thumb. And I want you to look at the distance between the last knuckle and the tip of your thumb. So that's about the size of some of our carpenter bees, like this one on the left, that gal there, and some of our bumblebees that I don't have a picture of here. So they can range a lot in size. We often uh, find that, um, that entomologists classify bees by the length of the tongue as well. So some of them have very long tongues and some of them have short tongues. So they're, they're very different in size, very different in color. So shout out, you ready? How many bees are native to North America? Mexico, continental US? 3,000. That'd be a lot. Kyle says three. Do I hear three? Going once, going twice. Do I hear oh. three and a half? Three and a half thousand. Four thousand. You got it. Ah. Well, done, <laughs> Chubb. Well, he's like, I got nothing. That sounds good. Okay. <laughs> so around 1,000 species of bee are native to North America. And of course, the honeybee is not one of them. It just adds to the diversity of bees that we have. Um, in Texas, I heard Dr. Jack Neff say about six years ago in a talk that there were about 1,100 that have been discovered. But I had a friend who knows this stuff really well, and she said it's actually around 1,300 now. And that doesn't account for those species that are not discovered yet. So it could be a few hundred more. So that's quite a lot of different bees. So they're quite diverse. Um, you'll notice that some of them are very fuzzy indeed, like we've gotten used to right there, but others look very wasp-like. And we'll talk about why that's so later. So they're very diverse. And they also nest in very different ways and have very different social structures from those of our honeybees. So our honeybees are what we call eusocial or truly social, right? They have a very well-developed community. They communicate with each other. They have specialized workers. They have specialized, um, uh, those that, that tend the larvae, for example. Um, you have queen bee. So everything is very highly structured. But I want you to kind of get that out of your mind for most of our native bees. While we do have some that are truly social like that, the vast majority are not. So the vast majority of our native bees are some form of what we call solitary nesters. So what's a solitary nester? So a solitary nester is single mom, single chamber for instance, wherever she makes it. And by the way, by and large, in our native bees, the boy bees don't participate in nesting, it's all the girl bees. So the girl bees, while they're tending their nest, creating it, but before they seal it off, they tend to sleep in there, the boy bees sleep outside. Generally speaking. Okay. So that's a solitary bee. And most of them are some form of solitary. We also have what we call aggregate nesters. And by the way, you can think of a solitary bee as a bee that, as someone who lives in a house on acreage, no neighbors nearby, they have their own house. Does that make sense? Okay. Then we have what are called aggregate nesters. So these are still solitary bees, and each gal has her own nesting chamber but they like to, to make their nests together. It's not a social nest like we have for honeybees because they're not doing stuff together and they're not dividing up labor. They just live in the same neighborhood. So I kind of liken that to um, a, a subdivision where you have a street with a bunch of houses on it, right? Each one has their own house, but they're side by side. So that's aggregate nesters. There are also what we call communal nesters. So these are still solitary bees in that each female has her own chamber, but they use a common entrance. That's why it's called communal. And then it branches out and each has her own little chamber. So I think of this as like a high rise uh, apartment building, you know, downtown where there's, you know, the door guy, the door person, right? Letting people in and out. Everyone comes in there, but they each go to their own home. And finally, we have truly social. So we do have truly social native bees. Primarily, we, we do have some of what we call some sweat bees that are social, but not as structured as honeybees. And bumblebees are another great example, but they're what we call primitively, primitively social, right? So for example, the queen looks like the worker bees. 
She doesn't look different. She's different from honeybees. She's just bigger. And at the start of things, when she's starting up the colony, the queen bee actually goes out and forages. So in the early spring, if you see a bumblebee in March, April, and it's clearly a female because she's got those pollen baskets like the honeybees have, but she's big. That's what we call a gyne, G-Y-N-E. And that's a female, it's a queen bee who's provisioning and starting up a new nest. That makes sense? So they're social, but they don't communicate with each other like honeybees do, and they're not quite as social as honeybees. So that's the different types of nesting. But they also nest in different places and use different techniques. So what you see here in these three columns are examples of the different way that our native bees nest. So you can imagine if they're solitary nesters primarily, they're not going to be in a hive or anything like that. Okay. So I want you to look at the far right. So this sweet little gal, remember all of this is in my front yard. This is a furrow bee, it's a female, Halictus. And she's sticking her little head out of the ground. So about 70% of our native bees nest in the ground. 70%. Okay. And they dig little tunnels like this. So what this means is if we want to have nesting sites for those native bees and wasps, then we need to have some part of our property that has well-drained soil in sun where humans don't walk along with no mulch. Or instead of mulch, loose leaves that they can get in. So about 70% oops, excuse me, nest below ground. About 30% <coughs> then nest above ground, but they nest in very different ways. So some of them are cavity nesters, and that's what you see here. So remember that teeny little bee that was only a few millimeters big? All the way to the big carpenter bee, they nest in, um, so the smaller ones can nest in pithy or hollow stems. So what you see here are some spent stems after the winter. And the mama bee will actually use her mandibles and chew in through the tip or through the side, and she'll make her nesting chamber in there. So if you see um, an old flower stem, for example, with the pith pushed out, <coughs> you may have a nesting mama bee. And this is why I, I like to tell people that, you know, after we get a freeze, what's the first thing you want to do with those dead plants? You want to cut them, right? Because they look awful. But I invite you not to do that because you might have baby bees in something. So I keep them up in my property until I clean up for the spring planting. What you see at the bottom here on the left is a species of female carpenter bee, and she actually nests in bamboo. So I'm going to show this video of her doing it. And if you listen carefully, <coughs> although I don't know if you can hear it over the AC, you can actually hear her chewing. Oops. Oh, it's not going to let me do it? It's not going to let me play the video. Oh, not sound. It was there no video on the next? There one? should be a video when I click. Uh, no. Okay, it's not going to let me play the video. Huh. Uh, no worries. Um, and then others will actually chew into wood, right? So those are our carpenter bees. These holes, I, my husband and I created, and they're being filled by what we call a leaf cutter bee. So a female leaf cutter bee gets that name because she will actually cut off a sort of a semicircle of leaf and use it as wallpaper to line that nesting chamber. She um, doesn't really chew her own hole in wood, for example, but she uses pre-existing crevices. And sometimes they'll, uh, they'll use bee boxes that people put out or they'll nest in stems or branches. But this one, if the video would play, you would actually see her harvesting it. So if you're ever out and looking at your plants and you see a semicircle cut from the leaf, you have a mama leaf cutter bee. Um, so those are some really interesting ones, and there are a couple who are really, really cool. So there's a type of bee called a cellophane bee, and they actually use, uh, let me see, hold on, they create ground nests that look like little volcanoes, and they line their nest walls with a plastic-like material that they get from an abdominal gland, and it not only cuts down on bacteria, but it waterproofs the chamber, which is really, really cool. And then there are bees that are called resin bees, um, or pebble bees, some of them, and they will take little refuse, like teeny tiny pebbles or little detritus that's lying around, and they'll use resin from plants and they'll cobble together this little shelter and the mama will nest inside. And you sometimes see those, like, for example, on branches of trees. I have yet to find one in my gardens, but I'm hopeful that someday I will. 
because I do have pebble beans in my garden. So they nest in all kinds of different ways. And it's a consequence of the majority being solitary. Um, I told you that the male bees tend to sleep outside and the female bees tend to sleep in their nest until they're done provisioning it. So if I could play the video, you would see on the bottom right, these little boy bees getting ready to nest for the night. So they tend to use their mandibles and they latch onto a stem or a leaf or the center of a flower and they sleep there overnight. So that some species they'll actually aggregate and I like to call those boy bee slumber parties, which is super cute. So in the evening, you'll start seeing them do this. The males will kind of buy for position to get the best position. So if you go out in your garden into an area where humans don't walk that often, you can often see them curling up. Oh, there we go. Okay, so what you're seeing here, well, this one's gonna play. There you go. See that? So do you see how this little one here is rubbing its hind legs? So what they'll do is they'll grasp and then they'll preen and the others will fly around and find the best spots on that leaf or stem. It's super cute. I could watch that for hours. So they also collect pollen in different ways and their larvae feed on pollen differently, sometimes from how our honeybees do. So let's think about how our honeybees forage and what their larvae eat. So honeybees are what we call generals, right? Pretty much as long as they don't have to use buzz pollination to get that pollen out, their larvae can feed on almost any type of pollen. This makes them really handy and really adaptable. Um, and they're really good pollinators for that reason. But that's not true for all of our native bees. The majority are generalists, but depending on where you are in the country, up to a quarter to a third of our native bees are what we call specialists on pollen. This means that their babies can eat the pollen of only those plants in a particular family, genus, or even species of plant. Can you imagine? Small fraction are specialists on a single species. But if that plant goes away because of urban sprawl or climate disruption, it's a problem, isn't it? So they do better, those specialists do in general, with those plants with which they co evolve That makes sense? Okay, and it's not, I don't know that they couldn't use the pollen from a plant in that family or genus that's not native to their area, they might be able to, but you're gonna check more boxes for native plants. Not at all true for honeybees who are generalists. In our part of the country, it's about 25% are specialists. When you get to central and western United States, it's 30% significant, so they feed differently. They also carry that pollen very differently. So you know how our gals who are honeybees carry that pollen? They have those little pollen baskets, corbiculi. They got divots in their hind leg and they get that wet pollen, they mix it with nectar or saliva and they squish it down in there. Well, our bumblebees do the same. They also have corbiculi, one on each leg, just like our bumblebee. This is an American bumblebee. That's not how the majority of our native bees carry their pollen. So most of them have specialized, that collect pollen has specialized hairs that they use that are very, they're bracted and they really are, they stick to pollen really well. So you kind of think of it like, um, like a dust mop. Does that make sense? The majority carry that pollen broom. That's what Scoville means in this broom. So they carry that on their hind legs. So I like to call these pollen pants and I have a friend who calls them Cheetos, right? <laughs> so they carry those pollen pants and they'll, they'll rub it off and put it on those sofa. Leaf cutter bees, remember we saw the mama that was lining her nest with that leaf? They have their, uh, their sofa in a very special place. They have it on their ventral abdomen. So if you see a native bee and they've got pollen pants or a butter butt, to get out and she's collecting pollen. And then they take that and they make it into a pollen <clears throat> love with nectar and saliva and they use that in their nest themselves. There is, uh, there is one group of bees called mass bees that carries it in a third of it. Very small number of bees do this. They actually have a crop like birds have crops. 
and they carry that pollen in the crop and regurgitate it when they get back to the earth. Kind of cool. When you don't have hands, you got to get clever. One last thing that I want to show you is buzz pollination. So buzz pollination is the way that bees and other insects actually pollinate certain flowers that the pollen is on the anthers in a certain way that you can't just get to it unless you shake it out vigorously. Does that make sense? And so we see this in um, plants in the potato family. So you see the tomatoes, you see the potatoes, you see with eggplants. Honeybees don't pollinate those, nor do the majority of our native bees, because the pollen is on the anther that's sort of covered up and you actually, it needs to be shaken to be dislodged. So only some bees, like bumblebees, and here you're going to see an example of a carbon bee, carpenter bee can do buzz pollination. So listen carefully to see if it works. Can't hear it. That's a female carpenter bee, and she's performing buzz pollination on that partridge bee. It's really cool to see. So there are some crops that are honeybees can't pollinate, even though they're excellent pollinators. Finally, there's this really quirky, cool group of bees called cuckoo bees. So someone tell me how a cuckoo bird, we're going to forget bees for a minute, what does she do for nesting? Yeah, she steals another nest and she lays her eggs in it. And when her babies hatch, they push out the host babies, and the mama bird, the host, feeds them and raises them. She doesn't have to make a nest, she doesn't have to feed her babies. So nature is really clever. And wherever you have bees, there are going to be kleptoparasites. In other words, cuckoo bees. Each of these is from my garden. And each of them is a cuckoo bee. So depending on the species, they will lay their eggs in the nest of different species of bee. So this one here, and I think this one here, lay their eggs in those leaf cutter bee nests. So they wait till the leaf cutter mama has gone off to get more pollen or a leaf, throw their egg inside, and that's why they have a pointy abdomen to flick it in. And then when it hatches, it kills the host larva or eats it. And then it eats the pollen and grows. I mean, nature's brutal, but efficient. Notice how they look like little wasps, don't they? Because they don't need hair. And they don't need pollinators because they don't condition their own eggs. And these girls will sleep outside with the boys because they don't have a nest to go home to. Pretty cool, huh? I'm actually, I have several friends who are like, oh, don't you just want to kill those guys because they're killing your bees? And I always say, no, because it's all part of this ecosystem. It's a web of life. And the fact that I have parasitic bees and predators and parasitoids throughout my garden of all kinds means I have a healthy garden. You're doing something right when you get predators and parasites. You're doing something right. And they have evolved to keep each other in balance. That's what they do. That's their job. So I rejoice and be glad. Plus, they're super cool looking, aren't they? Super cool. Okay, so now class is in session. Mm. This was developed for uh, Zoom, and I forgot to change that for live. So Zoom people, sorry. Um, so basically, I've got three true false questions. It's about our native bees. Don't worry, no penalty if you don't get it. Everyone's going to pass. I'm an easy creator. And I want you to say true or false, to shout it out. You ready? All native bee species lay their eggs in their own nest. Oh. Oh. Cuckoo bees don't, right? Most native bees nest below ground. True. True. About 70%. Y'all are doing great. Most native bees are social nesters like honeybees. Oh. Oh. 100%. They're usually some form of solitary, although we do have some true social nesters. And A plus for everyone. Well done, my class. Well done. Okay, so that's sort of the what I wanted to introduce you to. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about why, when our focus is on honeybees and raising them, why we should help, and I'm going to go a little bit broader, native bees, but more than that, native insects. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit because 
I always feel like it's not right to ask people to change how they bargain. You may not need to change how you bargain, but it's not right to do that unless you tell people why. That's not fair. So I always explain. So I'm going to explain. So this is a great study from 2006. I have to see if more studies have come out beyond that. Dr. Doug Callum cites it in his book, Bringing Nature Home. So they decided to focus, they knew that native insects, again, it's broader than bees. So we know honeybees bring us a lot of value, don't we? I mean, they're domesticated. You use them for honey production, 100%. But they wanted to know if that was true for native insects, not just bees. And so they tried to put a monetary value on the eco services that our native insects bring us. So again, not honeybees, because those are very well studied. We want to separate it out. And they said, we're estimating that it's around 60 billion a year, but we know that that's way low. Way low. So let's talk about some of these eco services that we should to provide. So, of course, crop pollination. Now, again, this is not honeybees, this is native insects. So, of course, about two thirds of our crops and a third of our food have to be pollinated by some type of pollinator. This may also include honeybees as well, of course, billions of dollars a year. That's self evident. But of course, it goes beyond crops. So, um, our flowering plants, whether it be tree or shrub or forb, about 75 to 95 percent of the flowering plants need some kind of animal to pollinate them. And by the way, more than insects pollinate. Any animal that while feeding on the nectar or pollen of the plant transfers the pollen from the male part of the flower to the female, that's a pollinator. And it can include, sometimes include uh, reptiles and bats. And it includes for insects, wasps, beetles, bees, wasps, sides, flies. Who knew, right? So all kinds of stuff. So about 75 to 95% of our flowering plants have to have some critter pollinator. And of course, more plants means more carbon exchange out of the atmosphere for oxygen, blood control, carbon sequestration. So they're also a really, really important part of the region. And I'm going to use birds for an example. Um, and for those who've read Doug Ptolemy's books, this will be old news, but it's always new for somebody in the world. So insects indirectly help our food chain because, of course, when they pollinate, and again, honeybees are native. When they pollinate, they help that plant produce berry, fruit, whatever it might be producing, and then something higher in the food chain will eat it, including us, because fruits are delicious. But in addition, insects are really, really good to eat. And they they're full of they can be full of protein or fat, depending on the insect, and they're really vital as one of those components of the food chain. So I'm going to use birds as an example of how important they are to that thing. So about 25% um, uh, of adult birds diet consists of insects, but we know that adult birds can also eat things like, depending on the species, grain, berry, nut, fruit, right? <coughs> so they can eat those things. But that's not true of their chicks. Okay. So for about 96% of our terrestrial bird species, not aquatic, but terrestrial, 96% have chicks that can own insects and other arthropods. They literally cannot digest the berries, nuts, and grains, and fruits, but they're adults and they cannot. And if they try it, they start. So they have to have insects. So Dr. Talamy started like either he did the research or he's reporting on someone else's research and I forget. But what they tried to figure out was, okay, then how many insects does a single mama bird need for a single clutch? I wonder what the number is. Intuitively, we could think dozens or a few hundred, right? That seems kind of in the zone. So they studied um, chickadees, eastern chickadees, I think, and the data was nothing short of sound. So a single mama, for a single clutch of chickens, a single season, one clutch, needs not dozens, not hundreds, but thousands of insects with their wings and arthropods. Thousands. And the numbers I've heard range from three to 9,000. I'm not going to give you a specific number. Thousands. 
In particular, caterpillars are highly prized by mama birds because they're soft, they have a lot of protein, and they have a lot of fat. And the babies can get it down in the esophagus without scratching. High in protein and fat. So if we don't have insects in our gardens, what happens to those baby birds? Start. What some of the, Dr. Ptolemy describes some of the researchers finding nests with only some of the eggs that the mamas would normally lay, or dead babies with things other than insects in their belly because the mamas were desperate. So we have to have those insects, and that's just birds. It's a powerful example, isn't it? So if you want insects in your garden, you have to have them. They also are really good at decomposition services. So they break down plant matter, they break down gum, they break down carrion. And when insects die and they break apart of the soil and they decompose, they actually release a lot of good things that are nutrition for the soil. Um, so I think nitrogen and other things. So I'm telling you in my gardens between using leaves for mulch instead of commercial mulch, if I do anything, and dead insects, I haven't used fertilizer in like four, four years or five years. I don't need to. I don't know if that's true for everything. And if I were growing vegetables, I might do something different. They're also amazing at pest control. So about four and a half billion dollars annually was what the study showed back in 2006. I love Dr. Callum's way of explaining to you guys, if you have a lot of insect pests, then you need more insects. Because okay? insects take care of their own. Between predators and parasites, parasitoids, they take care of their own. And again, it's sort of a cycle, right? So uh, how many of us have milkweed at home? Okay. So you know those yellow aphids that get on that milkweed, those oleander aphids? Those are really annoying and they can really cover our milkweed. And we also have pink aphids, and green aphids on different plants, and brown ones. So I, I used to, I didn't use pesticides, but I used to squish them and then hose them off. That's better than pesticides. But what I learned is that if I do that, I'm potentially getting rid of the eggs or the larvae of the predators that would take care of them naturally. So if you wait a couple of weeks, that sticky honeydew they leave, it attracts all of those adult predators flies, wasps, beetles, like lady beetles that lay their eggs in them, or inside the aphid. Have you ever seen a yellow aphid that's swollen and brown? That one is infested with a baby wasp. I've actually photographed a teeny little three or four millimeter mama wasp putting her egg inside. So if I squish them, I'm getting rid of those predators. It's very valuable in my garden. So we just have to go with the flow, right? Go with the flow. So now let's talk about why bees and other insects are in trouble. And I'm going to lump together honeybees, but with everything else, but in particular, our natives are having a hard time. So we could spend a week on this, it, and I'm not an entomologist and don't play one on TV, so I can't literally spend a week on this, but there are conferences that go for a week or two, and I have like two minutes. So let me just say that insects and other arthropods are in the world of trouble. You can see all these drivers of insect decline. So high among them, and by the way, it's a complex web. And scientists are still trying to unpack how these stressors relate to each other, right? The world's a big place. Insects are many and varied. So they are never gonna know all the insects in the world. They're never gonna know all of the stressors and how they relate. Well, they might. And they're just unpacking that in the last several decades. But already they're seeing patterns and they're seeing a web of things that work together and separately to hurt them. So high among those is habitat loss, fragmentation, and degradation. You know why? A lot of it is human. So this used to be coastal prairies and marshes ecoregion. You know, it's Houston. And we're not going anywhere. I like my home and I like my neighbors and we're not going anywhere. This is our home. But we have to do something to compensate for the fact that there's a lot of cement everywhere. And even where there isn't cement, we put in things and we've trampled ground and made it hard. Remember critters nest in the ground? We've made it unhospitable. 
um, climate change. So disruption of the climate, drought, right? Competition by non-native insects and plants and so on and so forth. A lot of different stressors. It's been described in the last couple of years as death by a thousand cuts. And again, the scientists are just scratching the surface of it. But already they can see the writing on the wall. And entomologists are asking us to do these things in the same screen. They're already seeing serious declines in insect abundance, diversity, and biomass worldwide. And they're asking us to act now, even while they're researching. So I work in an academic institution, and I know how academics say. I'm not a scientist. I don't practice that. But you don't start making proclamations until you're done with your research generally, and you're really sure. But they see that writing on the wall, and they know it's bad. And that's where it's pointed. And when they take off their lab coats, and they come out, and they start telling us to act, and we can do something about it, because it's for real. So they're calling for action at all level, international, national, state, city, and individual. And I'm gonna give you one stat. I brought it here, hold on, bear with me. So there was a, an interesting article in Manga Bay News. Um, and I'm not gonna find it. Don't worry, I've done this enough, I'll just I'll show it. So it was in Manga Bay News, which reports on the topic, and it was, I think, in June of 2019. And what the authors did was, it was a series of four articles. They interviewed 24 entomologists from six different continents representing 12 different countries. And they asked them each a single question. They said on a scale from zero to 10, with zero being no problem whatsoever, and 10 being, oh my gosh, it's dire. How would you rate the crisis in insect abundance? Just asking about abundance. So no one said below eight. Some said 10. So there's no way to sugarcoat it. It's just, it's really not good. So I don't know about you, but after that Debbie down moment, I need a bit of a rejoice and be glad moment. So you ready for the rejoice and be glad moment? Because there is one. Yeah. Right here, right now, right in your own gardens. We form a critical link in the chain that will save insects and most of the ecosystem. Here, right now, right at home. And we all know how the chain works, right? So it's as strong only as its weakest link. So it does mean, and I'm not going to tell you otherwise, that we still have to be engaged, however, we think best as individuals and be budget generals at that international, national, state, and municipal level. It's just that. It sometimes feels a little frustrating because it's not direct, right? It's less direct. Let's flip that thing. One of those essential links in the chain is our home front, the individual level. So that's empowering. That's great news, guys. And that's something all of us can do. And I'm going to show you why doing that raises the tide, lifts the tide for all boats, including honeybees. That and a cup of coffee gets me going again. All right? So, you want to hear a little more about that? Let's do it. Um, the answer really is to plant native plants in our gardens at home. And remember, let's kind of back up and remember very quickly why that is a thing. Because remember, I was telling you that about, well, actually, I'll get to that in a minute. So this is the bottom line. We need to create habitat gardens with native plants. And it's beyond the scope of this talk, because we got an hour to spend tonight, and that's it, and then Q&A. But it's about three things to do this. You ready? It's about plant selection, so native plants. It's about garden design. And it's about garden maintenance. We won't get to the design and maintenance tonight, but I'm happy to send a link to a recording of a talk that does later, okay? And I'm happy to answer that in the Q&A. We're gonna talk about plant selection tonight, okay? I think it's, well, and, and this is one of the reasons that we wanna do it at our home. You ready? Whether we have acreage, whether we have a, a, a single family home, whatever it might be, whether it's a patio with pots on it and we live in an apartment, it doesn't matter. 
because when we do it, it creates what um, what scientists call biocorridors. Some of them even use the word stepping stones. So remember that teeny little bee that is like four millimeters big on that Texas broad group? So she can't get from my house in Northwest Houston to Memorial Park. But by gum, she can get to my next door neighbor to the fire wheel there and get her pollen in there. And then she can go two houses down and get to their scarlet sage and have a nice little snack there. So we need to reintroduce those bio corridors to counter the fact that we have chopped up that Dr. Talony calls this homegrown national park. Isn't that the coolest? And if you go to homegrownnationalpark.org, there's a lot of great resources on it. Um, I would also say that when we have honeybee hives on our property, it's particularly important to plant these kinds of native plants that we're going to talk about in a minute. And that's because honeybees are in direct competition for forage with our native bees. They just are. They're limited resources. And so we need to make sure that there's enough forage for everyone. And not just forage. Remember that honeybees are generalists. They can eat a lot of different stuff. But the babies of native bees might be specialists. So we need to think about plant choice. And the good news is, when we plant for the native bees, we're also capturing, raising the tide for the vocal honeybees. We need to make sure there's enough to go around. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's talk about why native plants are better for, uh, for our insects. We're going to go broader than bees, but it includes bees. So there's actually kind of a debate in the native plant community about what native plant means, what the definition is. So some people say those plants that were here before European settlers came, or those plants that are within a 50 mile range, or etc. So I kind of like Dr. Calamy's way of understanding it. He calls it plants having a historical evolutionary relationship with a particular wildlife community. There's no such thing as a native plant in the abstract. That's not a thing. It, it's in relationship. So if you break that apart, it's really three things. So it's time. The plant's been there for millennia, not centuries, millennia, because that's how long it takes for critters and plants and plants and plants to co-evolve and develop relationships among each other. Place, the plant's been there for millennia in a place with similar conditions, light, soil, sun, and critters. And finally, things have evolved to use it, whether it's other plants or other critters. Does that make sense? So that's kind of a way to think of native plant. It's something that's been used by that community. On, uh, there are actually two handouts that for this talk, one of which, and I think they're going to be emailed to y'all afterwards. One of them has a list of resources for how do I know if something I'm looking at the nursery is a native plant? Where can I go on my phone? And another one is, hell, I have no idea what's native to where I live. Here are some places where you can pop in your zip code and there you go. Easy peasy. Okay, so we're in the Gulf Coast prairies and marshes ecoregion. So this part of Texas, and remember, Texas is the size of France, or I like to say France is kind of the size of Texas. Texas is pretty awesome. So it has a lot of different ecoregions and a lot of different conditions. So something in West Texas is probably not going to do well here where we get a lot of rain in the spring. We do. So again, we want to bring in native plants because they feed more fruit, right? We talked about how. For bees, at least 25 to over 30%, depending on where you live, can be specialists on the pollen of those plants in a particular family genus or even the same species. But it's even broader for that when you back up and look at insects. So the studies that you see here are indicating that about 90% of our plant eating insects, at some point in their development, are specialists. Let me say that again up to 90%. And primarily, not uniquely, but it's a lot of it is caterpillars, the larval stage. So things like butterflies and moths, family genus or even species. So a very common example is our monarch butterfly. So what do monarch caterpillars eat? Milkweed, genus Asclepius. So pretty much anything that's in that genus they can eat. That's an example of a specialist. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that. Uh, a critter that eats plants in a particular family or genus in North America can't ever consume something
something in the same, same family or genus from another continent. But they sometimes can, like our black swallowtails with bill and fennel and parsley. Those are not native to here, but they have native ones too that they can eat. It's just that more of them are going to be fed if we use those plants that are native to here, and you don't have to think about it. You have to think about it. So they feed more critters. This is why it's important to select our plants carefully. They're also hardier in our climate, right? So they're used to being drowned in the spring and moved in the summer, plain and simple. This translates to more money staying in my wallet because I have to water less and I replace them less. So like many of you who have acreage, I, I was talking, I think we were having a chat before. Um, I don't have a sprinkler, I don't have a sprinkler system. I have a hose. And in the brutal drought of July, I did have to spot water my two days a week in a couple of places, but there are still some plants and some over there that I, I haven't had to water because they're used to being moved in summer. Um, they also save and purify water and prevent erosion really well. Um, that's particularly these, these prairie plants. So prairie plants, and I'm talking about grasses and forbs, which are still our flowering plants, they tend to sequester water and carbon or carbon in the roots. So let's talk about carbon for a minute. So trees sequester it primarily in the trunk and trees do a better job than grasses and then forbs at sequestering carbon. It's just that when they burn, they release it all. This is what's happening in some of those wildfires out in California, for example, and other parts of the whole country. So they sequester carbon, but it's released when the trunk burns. Not really so with prairie plants. Because grasses and a lot of these forbs, they store their carbon below ground in the root. So overall, there's a study here from 2018 that says when you compare it in the time of wildfires, grasslands are pretty dang good, even compared to trees. And the reason for this is there are fires on the prairie. And bison eat the grasses, right? And the forbs. So they're used to being trampled, eaten, and burned. So they keep all their stuff below ground. Their roots can also be 12 to 14 feet deep. So deeper than an adult human is tall. So that's what I want in my garden because the deeper the root, the more carbon and water they sequester. So the statistic I got from the Coastal Prairie Conservancy, it's called Katy Prairie Conservancy back in 2018. They threw these stats around. I thought it was really interesting. They said, the St. Augustine grass in an average rainfall can sequester about half an inch of water per hour. So not a lot because the roots are shallow. But a full-on prairie, like the Katy Prairie, can sequester inches of water. So I want that in my garden in Houston because hello, Harvey. Hello, rainstorms. I'm getting more of those with my so I don't know how many inches my sequester my sequester. It's not a full on prairie. It's imitating a prairie, but it sure as heck is more than St. Augustine grass. So they're particularly good. And it's also okay if they get out. So this is I know that Chinese tallow honeybees love it. I know they do. But I'm going to invite you to eradicate it from your life. Here's why. Remember, a rising tide lifts all boats. So if we do things to help our native critters and pollinators, we're also helping our honeybees. For sure, we don't want to plant things that hurt the ecosystem and then hurt those critters. So this is a seedling that was in my neighbor's garden bed for a while I was populating their garden bed. Look at that root. It's longer than my hand. So here's the problem with Chinese tallow. It grows fast, right? It was brought in for commercial reasons. It was brought in for landscaping. It's here, but it grows fast. Virtually nothing eats the leaf. So right there, because nothing really eats the leaf, it has an advantage to our native plants that critters eat because they evolved with them. Right there, it's got an advantage. And it creates the canopy <coughs> relatively quickly that shades out and destroys swaths of berry and what we blend with it. And that root is almost impossible to eradicate. In fact, this is the only time where I would say cut down the base and brush an herbicide on it. Because you are not digging out the whole branch of this trunk and it will come back. The birds love the berries and they spread them everywhere. So I am going to, again, I don't ask people to do something without giving them 
guidance. So I'm going to give you substitutes for this. Okay. The problem is if they get out, they now feed our natives. There's nothing to release them, and that's the problem. Whereas if we have aggressive natives, they've always been there. So it's all right. If you have not read Dr. Talamy's books, I've mentioned them a couple of times, and I highly recommend them. So the one on the left came out over 10 years ago. The one on the right came out in 2021, I think, in February. It's a continuation. If I were to buy only one, I would get Nature's Best Hope. That's the one where he talks about homegrown national park. Fantastic books. He's an entomologist who doesn't write like an entomologist, right? It's so accessible, easy peasy. And if you Google him on YouTube and you go to his website, fantastic talks. He's just wonderful. So now let's talk about some plants that are early spring bloomers that our honeybees can use and our native critters can also use. And I'm going to introduce you to a few. So let's talk first about four. So these are non woody herbaceous plants, primarily those that also have flowers, but not green. So if I could recommend one Ford to it, it would be this. It's also called Indian blanket, but I like to call it fire wheel. It's Galardia Pulchella. So I have every time, so on this one, I have in my garden, you can see my little honeybee on it and my other bees. This one is pollinator central, okay? What I like about it is several things. So first off, don't plant it in your yard if you don't have full sun. I know that some of the guys say it can take part sun. Nope. It wants full sun. The only way to kill it is to give it too much TLC. Do not overwater it. Once it's established, ignore it. This, these plants, I literally have not watered even through July. Two months without rain almost. Didn't water it because I don't need to. It likes garbage soil. Um, it's a long lived annual, so it's not a perennial, but it reseeds freely. It comes up early in the spring and it lasts. Mine are just now starting to go to seed, so it'll last till early fall. Uh, it is amazing. That's my favorite. Once you have it, you always have it. I also recommend that I, and I have seeds for firewood. I also have seeds for this, Lansley Coryopsis. So this is also in my garden, and I personally like with the fire wheel, seeing honey, honeybees on it as well. You can see the photo there. So this one blooms only in the spring. Um, I have a few blooms that I'm hanging on now. It's also one of those plants that I don't directly water. It gets a little bit of a drink when I water things around it. The flowers are pretty and yellow. These are composite flowers like fire wheel. And here's why composites are really awesome. You ready? Because the center is actually dozens or hundreds of teeny little flower cells. Each of those has its own nectar of pollen. So you get a lot of bang for the buck with these, uh, these kind of aster flowers. So here's some of the information on it. This one can go down to part shade, but it doesn't bloom as robustly. It gets about two feet tall. It's blooming by March. This one is a perennial and will come back from the root even if it freezes. Okay. It's a great plant and I have seen some Prostrate blind cup. I have personally seen honeybees on this. I have this in my garden. This is xeric. It is highly drought tolerant and I don't water mine. Even this July, I think. You've got to have a full sun and well drained soil, and I have seeds for you over there. So um, it blooms in early March. It really doesn't bloom much after the spring. I have one or two blooms that come up in the summer. But if you give it extra water in the spring, you may get a second round of flowers. But when it blooms, look at that. It's semi evergreen, so the leaves will stay green most of the year and then will come back from this sort of this tuber. Highly recommend. Um, I also have this in my garden. It's called Scarlet Sage, um, sometimes called Blood Sage, Salvia coccinea. So this is in the mint family. I've seen honeybees feeding on it. So on this slide, what you see is you see the honeybee doing what we call nectar robbing, which is what each of these is doing. So what they do is they wait until these larger bees poke a hole and suck out the nectar, and then they piggyback and suck out the nectar. But they also collect pollen from the anthers, and that's what she's doing. I've seen um, butterflies are, are very well suited to this, and moths because they have the long proboscis, right? Hummingbirds love it. 
So this one starts blooming early and it will bloom until it dies back in the trees. It is perennial, but it will come back aggressively being in the mint family from the seed as well. Uh, I am having to put this with water in the ground. But you can also put it all the way down to our shade. And those in the shade, I give less water. I just put it in the shade you're in. This I also have in my gardens. I do see honeybees on it, not as many, but the native bees are all over it, including bubblebees. I have seeds for you. This is called yellow wild indigo. It's a Baptisia spiritarpa. Um, it blooms early, starting in March. It has these gorgeous yellow flowers and these really interesting marble-sized seed pods. I do not water mine, and I put it in full sun. So this is a great plant. It's perennial and will come back to you. I cannot highly recommend, enough recommend blue balls, Minerva. In particular, I like spotted blue ball. Uh, this is a huge favorite of bees and wasps. Huge favorite. And remember, wasps are also pollinators. And wasps, the mamas feed, their larvae are um, their larvae are uh, predaceous, and so they sting and paralyze those garden pests and other insects and put them in the nest for their babies. So um, this blooms a bit later, in July or August. I am having to try to eat it with water a couple of times a week, but otherwise it's pretty it's pretty great. There are actually three species that are native. There's um, there's well, I'll let you know afterwards. You can ask them. And the wildflowers in the yard. So a lot of us, we mow our yards quite more often than we really need to. And I would recommend that in the early spring, when we get wildflowers, if they're native or not, just let leave patches of them for the critters to feed on. Because a lot of other things are not in bloom. And if you want it to look intentional, here's a great trick. I put bricks around mine. So I mow around it and I put around bricks and it looks like a garden home. My neighbors have no idea. Again, critters and community. Huh? Right. So I don't have an HOA that really has any power. So you have to check your HOA. But if you make it look like a garden thing, you might get away with it. Sure, you can do it in the backyard. Most HOAs don't like it. So let's talk about some trees. So I have this Mexican plum. Highly recommend Mexican. This is a fantastic substitute for Chinese mallard. Fantastic substitute. It doesn't bloom long, maybe two to three weeks, but it's blooming by early March and bees are all over this one. Um, it doesn't get that tall either, 15 to 25 feet. It, I haven't really watered mine during the drought. It can take part shade, but it's really happy in the full sun. And the leaves are the larval host plant for at least one butterflies and moth species. You see, if they can evolve with it, they can do it. So I recommend this as well. It actually has these little plums that are edible. People make jam out of them, but I leave them in my favorites. Uh, red bud. So this is our variety that's native to here, Eastern red bud. It is hugely popular with bees. You can see over here a mason bee, Venus Osmia in blue. Uh, um, these can take sun to part shade. They don't require a lot of water and they don't get that tall, 15 to 30 feet. They bloom early as well. This is another great substitute for Chinese Mallard. Another great substitute. And the leaves, again, they host the caterpillars to serve like a doctorate species. So you get pollen, nectar, and uh, I'm going to go a little bit quickly through these because I know we're getting a little bit long on time here. So this I do not have. This is a cherry laurel. Um, Julie shared this uh, image with me. So this one takes moderate watering. It does get a little bit taller, but it blooms early in February. So again, it's a nice early bloom. It has pollen and nectar as a resource. Its leaves also feed butterfly caterpillars, and it has berries for wildlife in the fall. The seed stems and leaves and seeds are highly toxic for pets and people, so I would not plant it where I have dogs or cats. I would not. And it's possibly deer resistant. 
I have this in my garden. So it's a real pond holly. Um, we have two hollies that are native. This one is evergreen. This has male and female trees. Only the female has the pretty red berries that you see here. I love this one. So this one I installed in like January or February of this year in my gardens. And I still haven't intentionally watered it even through the drought, which is amazing for a tree that's under a year old. It actually looks more like a scruffy shrub most of the time, but you can kind of prune it a bit. Once you have it, it does tend to spread. So I would put it in an area where you don't mind that that happened. It doesn't get very tall, however. It's a house plant for certain caterpillar species. Birds love the berries. Great pollen and nectar source in April, moderately deer resistant. Um, Julie highly recommends this, the two winged silver bell. I do not have that. Isn't that a lovely flower? So this one uh, blooms in April. So again, it's fairly early blooming. It does get a bit taller, sometimes up to 30 feet. This one can take sun or part shade and only moderate watering. Great for wildlife. Leaf is the you know, host plant for certain moths, palmer and nectar. You see a pattern here. Leaf is used, the flower is used, the nectar is used. And white fringe tree. I don't have this, but I have friends who do and they really like it. Very similar to the two wing silver bell that we just saw, except a little bit shorter, maybe only 20 feet. Again, pollen, nectar, barbel host plant, berries for wildlife, moderately deer resistant, not a ton of water, sun to part shade, lather, rinse, repeat. So these are all good choices. And I think I'm gonna stop here because I don't we'll run out of time. Okay, does that help a little bit? Yeah. Did you learn something about our bees? Yeah. Aren't they the coolest? Okay, so let me tell you about some of the goodies I have over there. So we have seeds, take the time. Uh, I'll answer Q&A now, but if you want to get up, take a time, your time and look. Uh, I have some books. Um, the Bees in Your Backyard, I highly recommend. The same authors have just come up with a guide to common bees in the eastern United States to help you identify some of the critters in your yard. There's one from the Xerxes Society that suggests plants for native bees, but not all of those will be native to you. Okay. And keep your eye out for those two PDF um, handouts that will give you that are organized by this and will give you resources to click on and go to on the web. And that's that, my friends. Questions? Uh, so Mexican coral vine. So I don't think the Mexican coral vine is, but there is a um, there's a coral honeysuckle. That's a really great plant. It blooms spring. I got it blooming now a little bit too. And I, I kind of like that one. Yeah, that one's a very talkable one because critters do like it. Any other questions that I can answer? Chinese tongue pops in it. I heard something like it was. I don't know. Um, I've heard people say that there may be chemical in the leaf that's a little path meaning that it discourages the growth of plants around it. You see this in black walnut, eucalyptus, and magnolia. However, I've seen sources that say that that's not happening. So I can't, I can't say that about Chinese tallow. I don't know that everything can eat the fruits, but I know that birds do, that some birds do. But it's problematic for a bunch of other bees. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, they love it, the bees, but that's the one I would yeah, it's like the Hippocratic Oath, first and you don't harm, right? Any other questions I can answer? You know anything about pepper honey? I don't. I wish I did, but I do not. You sprout it up and it's huge and covered with bees. Uh, it, so it's, it's tiny little, little flowers. You probably don't even look like flowers. You know, in, I don't know. Oh, it's um, it's like a, it's herbaceous. It has big green leaves, teeny little flowers. Or am I thinking of something no. different? Uh, Okay, I, I would love to see it happen. <laughs> you know, in my gardens, I have maybe five to seven percent of the plants, maybe ten percent that are not native to our ecoregion. But those that I have are not invasive. So there's a difference between being not native and being invasive. Invasive is a non-native 
that spreads and that can't be kept in check and that is detrimental to the plants around it. The more native plants you have, the better that little ecosystem is going to work. But even I have some, like I have, um, I have purple palm flower, Echinacea purpurea. It's native to way up in the northern part of Texas, northwest, sorry, northeast. But I put it in and I didn't know any better. It's not invasive, it's staying right there. And, you know, and there it's going to live until it dies. My rule of thumb is when something that's not native dies, if it's, naked, if it's invasive, I take it out. And I've removed several things that I learned afterwards were invasive, they're gone. Absolutely gone, immediately. But if a non-native dies, then I replace it only with something native to the ecoregion. That's my rule of thumb. And that's what's gotten me to that high percentage. And that's what's gotten me a bunch of critics. Like we just had our 54 species of butterfly in our gardens. Several years ago, I stopped counting at 30 species-ish of bee and wasp. I just stopped counting. Yeah. If your yard legal means of anything to have your yard classified. Ah, great question. So the first thing is before you do anything, you need to check if you have an HOA, you need to check what their rules are. Um, in my area, we have something that's, it's not technically an HOA, it's got a different name. It's like HOA light. And what they exist to do, among, we don't even have mandatory fees. They exist to enforce the deed restrictions primarily. So the deed restrictions, which are not very detailed, govern my situation. So for mine, I don't need pre-approval. It doesn't give a list of plants, thank goodness. So if you have a, a, an HOA with regulations that puts the kibosh on this, then what I would say is, first off, you need to, there are a couple of ways to do it. Often they don't regulate the backyard. So you can do pretty much what you want in the backyard if your HOA is okay with that. Second, you can sometimes, by having conversations in advance, you can sometimes get them to vet things or to approve things. The worst is you invest money and time to put things in, and then they tell you to rip it out. The certifications that you're talking about, so there's one that the city of Houston has by ordinance, and that's separate. And the rest are just things like, from nonprofits, and they don't have any legal ramifications, but what they do is by putting signs up and getting the certification, it helps your neighbors understand. So for example, we're a Monarch Way Station through Monarch Watch, a certified butterfly garden through North American Butterfly Association, and a certified wildlife habitat through uh, National Wildlife Federation. So each of them has a sign, and I put the sign up. So passersby see, that it's not unintended, it is intended. Does that make sense? My friend says intended and not intended. So they get what I'm doing. There's no legal backing there. The city of Houston had an ordinance, and I need to refer, I, I would check to see if it's still there. It had an ordinance that made an exception to the nuisance law. So the nuisance laws are the ones that say your grass can't get over this tall. You can't have vermin, you can't have weeds, whatever weeds means. And so sometimes a neighbor or someone might complain, the city comes in and they issue a citation. They have a statute and it's called like the natural something ordinance that, that says you get some flexibility in what you plant if you can get certified with the city as a natural area. Does that make sense? So they have to come in, they have to confirm, so your, your planting's gonna be a little taller, they have to be a certain distance street but maybe less than otherwise that kind of thing except your hoa rules trump it there is a state law in the property code that was um enacted in the mid 2010s so 2013 14 and it was it was after we had those series of droughts after hurricane ike remember that and it's about water conservation. And it basically says that in certain areas, HOAs cannot unilaterally 100% shut down the use of rain barrels, the use of xeric landscaping, okay? It doesn't talk about native plants. It says they can regulate it and regulate the heck out of it, but they can't ban it. 
So some people are using that to bootstrap in, you know, making the argument that drought tolerant native plants fit those kinds of plants. Does that make sense? What would really be nice is if there was an ordinance or legislation, and that trumps HOA, that, that limits HOAs. So it would be nice if we had state or municipal laws that actually carved out an exception for this, right? Even more so. But um, we're getting here, if I did. So that's where my two worlds collide, right there. Law and privilege. Uh, any other questions? We have a lot of pine trees. Does anything eat the pollen from a pine tree? And what eats the pollen? Uh, I do not know. I don't know. And are they wind pollinated? Yeah, yeah they're wind pollinated. Um, so I don't know that things eat it, but I don't know that they don't. Any other questions, y'all? Okay, thank you for letting me descend for an hour and 15 minutes and speak out about me. <laughs> Okay, on. Well, Lauren, thank you very much. That's fantastic. Sort of like drinking from a fire hose and all that. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, that's great. And also, uh, just some, you didn't mention it, but if you're, I, I happen to have a neighbor named Jaime who works for uh, oh. Nature Conservancy. So he's my next one. So when I don't know what a plant is, I, I ask Jaime, it's like, what, what is this one? Should I pull it up or read it? But there's a program in your phone called iNaturalist, and it's basically like having a Jaime in your pocket because <laughs> you point your phone at, take a picture. And this thing will pop up and tell you if it's a native to your area or if it's in the basin and you'll know leave it or pull it so it's pretty good so that that's very helpful for those of us who can't tell one plant from another for the most part okay um so coming up this saturday is national honeybee day and that's six to eight o'clock at the waterworks and on buffalo bayou that's going to be great fun uh, kyle and i will be there with uh Houston Beekeeper Association booth set up or table or whatever with information. Um, and then at eight o'clock, show in the bee movie. That'll be fun. And our September meeting, which is on the 20th of September, we have uh, Dr. Farah Ozturk talking about uh, bee products and human health. And in October, we're working on showing people how to put together bee equipment. That's for our newer beekeepers. In November, is our potluck and no end of board elections. So. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for watching on Zoom. And I was so oh, uh, door prize. We have only one door prize tonight. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. The door prize is. This your is book. a book of photos from my garden. I, I do have this family gifts every year. So I give them away at my books. Okay, perfect. So the first new one is 386 889. Gotta be here. I didn't see my. Right. And then, of course, we all win because Lauren has all the seeds back there. You can get your garden going, so that'll be great. So thank you all for coming, and I'll see you all next month. Thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure.